Welcome to episode number 40 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan. Thank you very much for tuning in this week. I want you to keep an eye on my YouTube channel. Next week, I'm going to be posting a video because I have been challenged by TC Houston of the Reptile Mountain YouTube channel. I don't want to give you any more information than that, but he has started this challenge and he has challenged me to do something in my reptile room. So I will make a video on that next week and we're going to start, uh, hopefully this goes viral and we can get other people in, in on the challenge. But again, I'm going to keep it at that. So you're going to have to tune in next week on my YouTube channel to see exactly what I'm talking about. If you are enjoying the podcast, don't forget to share it with your friends and family as well as give it a rating on the Apple Podcasting app. As always, this episode is sponsored by CustomReptileHabitats.com. Notes are in the show notes as well as the description on YouTube. Definitely go check them out. There is a massive array of high quality reptile equipment including enclosures and backgrounds and whatnot. So definitely go check them out. Joining me on the podcast today, all the way from Northern Alberta in Fort McMurray, is Emily Medeiros. Now, Emily is really a jack of all trades when it comes to the animal world. She has done so many different things, even though she is very young. She has worked at Reptilia, which is Canada's largest indoor reptile zoo. She now runs Reptile Rodeo, which is a reptile education business out of Fort McMurray in Alberta, Canada. She also works at a holistic pet food store, which specifically specializes in dog and cat nutrition. So we spend a lot of time talking about some of the misconceptions when it comes to what you should be feeding your dog and cat. She's also taken a bunch of different animal related courses, everything ranging from animal behavior all the way to forestry and wildlife conservation. This is an episode that will absolutely get your gears turning. You know, so many of us want a job that's related to animals, but just assume, you know, vet or biologist is the only way to go. Emily will absolutely introduce you to some new areas or different areas that you may have not thought of previously. Enjoy the episode. All right. Well, Emily, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Well, despite how you're obviously quite a young individual, you've worn many different hats in the animal world. So I, I, I love having people like yourself on because there are so many people who have a passion for animals and then have no idea what to do with it. And it, when we get to talk to people like yourself, it may spark some different areas that they never thought about before. So, so super excited to jump into some things with you. In terms of your passion or your love for animals, do you remember when or how that started? Obviously, as a child, I'm sure. Yeah, I definitely started as a child. I think that that's actually super important for, I think, most animal lovers is when it's been introduced at such a young age. Um, I'm not even sure when it started because that's how early it did. But um, growing up, um, when my parents were together when we were kids, my dad was always a very outdoorsy person. Um, he was always adamant on every year we had camping trips. Um, we always had pets of some sort when we, before I ended up starting getting dogs and other things, I actually started off with smaller rodents, such as rats. As a kid, I had a lot of rats for pets. Every time me and my brother would have a rat and they would pass away, we would get some more. And then we just rotated through different rodents. But my dad kind of always made sure that we were comfortable with nature, comfortable with animals. And then at a very young age, I started getting into a little bit of reptiles. My first reptile was a little leopard gecko named Coco that my dad got from his friend. And from reptiles, I just sort of moved into our family dog and then just exploded from there. And just continuing wise, I was very young when it was introduced to me. So I love them. Yeah. And actually rats are a great pet for, for kids to start with. They're just yes. so simple to care for and they're just so interactive. Yeah, they're very misunderstood. When I was actually very young in element, just elementary school, um, I did a speech on my life as a hooded rat because I wanted to do a speech. I think I was, gosh, I was only maybe like 10. And I wanted people to know that they weren't as gross and creepy as people think rats are. And I did a little speech on them for my school. And I actually ended up getting to uh, competing with the speech. Um, ended up losing to some better ones. But, you know, I had the, the point out there. I was hey, you got the rats there. out there. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, they're, they're fantastic pets. So... In terms of, I guess, when you were a child, did you always think my life will be an animal involved in some way? Did you have a goal or a career passion that you were trying to pursue? Or were you just going to think I'm going to be involved with animals somehow or another? Yeah, I kind of, I'm, even to this day, it's still like, my dad is, he, I get a lot of from my dad in the sense that he likes to have like game plans and he's pretty set on what he wants. Me, I'm like, I know the direction in which I want to go and I always kind of have, but I'm not really stuck on an individual career because I'm just a person who's so go, go, go. Like everybody who knows me knows that I can never stop. And I just, I love to continue to learn new things as I get bored very easily. So when I was a kid, I definitely rotated through many different ideas of what I wanted to be. 
for the longest time, I wanted to be a veterinarian because I figured that that was the only way to work with animals when I was really young. Um, slowly started to realize that I'm not as good with blood as I, I hoped I would be. Um, and it switched from wanting to be a, a veterinarian to a marine biologist to a wildlife photographer. And now it's kind of like, I'm not quite sure where my end goal is, but it's all the animal field. I just kind of wor- want to work with them all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's a very millennial thing to to not have this one career that you lock down in and then see yourself 35 years later retiring from. I think that is more of our parents' generation and that's kind of how things were. But now as a millennial, it's more, I mean, people are getting more jobs throughout a lifetime. You have way more jobs than our parents typically. And I, I think that's just the way the world is structured now. So there's really nothing wrong with that. Yeah, definitely. So then in, while well, you were still, uh, in the or Ontario area, you were working at Reptilia. So I'd love to hear about that because I, well, actually maybe you could tell everybody what it is first because there's probably some listeners that have never heard of it. Yeah, definitely. So um, when I, <clears throat> I was in college at the time and I was working just your basic retail jobs. And of course that was very understimulating for me. Um, like my father, I have a natural calling with animals and I really wanted to work with animals. So I started to just start to look for other jobs. At the time I was working in a hat store. And I saw a ad posting for a, a zoo in Vaughan, Ontario, kind of by the Canada's Wonderland area called Reptilia. And they were hiring a tour guide. Now, I had reptiles at this time. I had started to collect them. I had a lot of crested geckos were my big thing and chameleons and some snakes. And I was interested in pursuing the idea of reptiles more because I had gotten so into it. So I applied for this tour guide position at Reptilia and I was called for an interview, which is really exciting. And just because of how uh, expressive I was and how much I I guess I talked well and how passionate I was about it and had my own reptiles, they seemed to like who I was as a person. And this was a privately owned zoo, so they didn't require anybody being hired to necessarily have zoology and biology degrees, which of course I didn't. I was going to to college for actually um, criminal stuff at the time. So I went um, for my interview, got good, I got the job, and I just learned so fast and had such good teachers there that I quickly worked my way up the chain and I was still doing tours, but I was also able to cover for like zookeepers when they were away. One day, I'll never forget the day that the head zookeeper, Cheryl, she went away and I was, for two days, I was responsible for her duties. So taking kind of in the footsteps of the head zookeeper and it was very exciting and I learned so much there to the point where Within the year, I was taking testing and even working with the venomous animals and dangerous animals. It was great. And I love that place. They're all about education. And I think everybody, if they're in the Ontario area around Vaughan, Canada's Wonderland, you should definitely check them out. They have another location in Whitby too. Now they just opened. Yeah. I've actually been to the Vaughan location as well. I guess I think I was there in 2016. So would you have still been working there at that time? That was was the... First, that was um, a little bit after I just moved to Fort McMurray. So you were there just after I left. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And it, it is amazing. It is, it's one of those places where you walk in and everything is clean. The enclosures look incredible. They're huge enclosures. Like even for, I remember like seeing the day gecko enclosure and it was just massive. And there, I think there's like one or two day geckos in there. And it, it just keeps going. It's, it's, a, it's a really fantastic place. So I, I imagine working there must have been a dream job. Oh, it definitely was. I, I, in no way, shape or form did I want to leave the place. It's just as also as a kid, one of my dreams was to move out to Alberta. When I was little, I thought I'd be riding horses in the Calgary Stampede because I always rode horses as a kid, but Alberta was still my goal. And, and there was a calling for it. The the guy that I was with, uh, that I'm still with now, he, he was out here and it was, it was time for me to go with him. So I left, but I definitely miss it every single day. Um, the environment, how Focus they are on education and enrichment of the animals is wonderful. Did you have a favorite animal there? Oh, definitely. Um, Reptilia is kind of what got me into one of my favorite reptiles being the black and white Argentine tegus. Um, that was there. There was one there. His name was Joey, and he was by far my favorite. When the zoo was closed and I was done all the duties, I was always requesting to go hang out with Joey a bit and do some enrichment with him or give him a snack. He was definitely my favorite animal there. I think I remember Joey because I, I, I think part of the tour was there was like a little sh- a show that you could sit down a little auditorium and they, I think they brought Joey. I think, I don't know if it was Joey, but it was definitely a black and white tegu and he pooped on the stage. <laughs> oh my God. Yep. Sounds Does like that sound Joey. like him? Because <laughs> we also did, uh, Reptile also had um, back quarters where, that weren't open to the public that contained a lot of animals that we would use for educational purposes when we would leave the facility and travel around the GTA. So they did have a few there, but some of the popular ones for the shows they would definitely bring out, like Joey, just because he was such a good crowd pleaser and good with people. 
So part of that job as well was also going to people's homes or, or parties and doing some education, right? Yeah, definitely. That was that was a fun part that got you out of the zoo, but allowed you to bring your education to somebody who didn't quite couldn't quite come to the zoo or just wanted the party at their house. So up until you started doing that, did you have a passion for educating as well? Or did you just realize that while you were going through that role that this was something that you enjoyed? Um, I, I pretty much like so from a young age, so going back to like when I had talked about how I did a speech that one time, I've always just been pretty good at speaking with crowds. Like, don't get me wrong. I always get that stage fright, but I just speaking with people, especially about a topic that I know about and watching them comprehend and understand what I'm saying was quite rewarding. Um, I definitely got most of that spark of interest for it working at Reptilia, but I've always liked to kind of speak to a crowd and kind of get them to understand what I'm saying. So it, it just kind of started mostly that big spark at Reptilia because I had this knowledge on this class of animals that many people didn't know about. And I was learning knowledge so fast and absorbing it like a sponge that it was really nice to just release it all out onto everyone else and spread the education of especially reptiles because they're misunderstood animals. But at one point I wanted to be a horse uh, back riding instructor too. So I've always just kind of wanted to teach, but not necessarily in a school setting. So it's interesting that that I, I guess your passion for animals just is there any limits to it or does it extend to all animals for the most part? Are there any areas that you're uncomfortable with in terms of certain species or, or, or whatnot? Um, I'm actually pretty open to learning about many like I've had dreams of trying to learn about African animals by going to Africa for a touring um, I definitely would like to learn a little bit more about like insect insects and arachnids. Um, I know a little bit. I do have a couple tarantulas and stuff, but I mostly my my most of my knowledge does span from um, North American mammals and then reptiles um, themselves. So I would definitely be open to working with all animals, even the ones that make me uncomfortable. I think that venomous snakes, for example, are extremely intriguing. And I loved that I got to work with them. But it was definitely a part that I needed to learn to work through my adrenaline because I would get I get pretty shaky when I have adrenaline. And that's not really key when you're dealing with a venomous snake on the end of a hook. So the venomous animals, they do make me a little bit more nervous. But because I'm always so determined and so confident in learning, I'm always up for the challenge. So there's not really anything I don't want to learn about. I remember, at, I think at Reptilia, I, know, I remember seeing a black mamba. I forget what else. There, there was a few venomous snakes there for sure, right? Yes. Yeah, that's uh, that's a little bit, I'm sure, frightening to work with at first. Did you guys actually, did you actually have to hook them as well? Or was it mostly offhand? I mean, I'm sure you weren't handling them, but I'm sure there was also moving from, you know, a tub or something like that. Yeah, generally, um, we tried not to, you touch as little as possible just to avoid any accidents or anything. But just like all the animals in the zoo, of course, they need their cleaning um, and their feeding. So there were situations in which you have to be um, remove that glass barrier between you and have protective tools and know the safety regulations. We had the venom room, which had the double door, the red light, the radio cues of when we were in there and when we were exiting and always with second people, there was, there was safety measures to be taken. But um, it wasn't usually handling just for the sake of pleasure. It was always for some sort of training purpose for the employees to learn how to do it or because the animals needed to be removed from their enclosures to be clean, to be kept healthy. But they definitely wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be handling them or anything for any reason that wouldn't be educational or for sanitary purposes. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I find the uh, the fact that you're so interested in horses as well fascinating. I actually see a lot of people who are in the reptile hobby or industry who also either have horses or are huge fans of horses. And I wonder, now I'm starting to realize maybe they're just animal lovers in general and they just kind of extend along. But when you were in Mississauga, were you surrounded by horses or 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 was it just something that you were interested in? So you thought, for those that are not in Canada, Alberta is like our kind of our, our cowboy province. So if you want to work with horses, that's probably where you would end up. But were you surrounded by horses originally? Yeah, from a very young age, too. That's one of the first, um, like, I did sports as a little kid, like, toddler, four years old, you get your little Tim Horton soccer, soccer team and running through the field. And uh, me, I'm the type of person that when it comes to sports that don't involve animals, I'm never sure which net to put it in. So I'm always kicking it in the wrong net. I don't really understand the whole sports thing. But I was always interested in horses. I had a horse themed room. My dad made baseboards on the wall to make it look like a pen. So when I was finally old enough, I started taking horseback riding lessons <clears throat> at a, um, a riding school in Mississauga, Meadowlark Stables, which is actually still there. And that's where I started getting my lessons. But even before that, my dad had friends and farms we would spend most of my childhood on that had horses and I'd go for pony rides. So it started at a very young age with horses. And still to this day up here in Alberta, I had friends with horses. Um, I help 
I love riding the crazy ones because I like trying to train them. It's, it's a lot of fun. So horses have been in my life my whole life. Yeah, that's amazing because I, I really love horses as well. My dad has horses, but I'm definitely not comfortable around them. I, I didn't grow up around them. And I can't imagine getting on a crazy one. And even like the size of them, if, if you've not been around a horse, really, as soon as you get up to a horse, you realize they're actually really intimidating. But there's there's that connection that a human can have with a horse that's almost unfound in, in other places, maybe with a dog as well. Yeah, definitely. They. I, that's another thing that as a kid, too, I thought that I wanted to end up doing was um, I wanted to open up a riding school for like autistic kids because the ki- horses are known so much for being good with uh, autism and they can sense emotion and they're actually pretty sensitive creatures. They're very intimidating for their size and what they can do, but they uh, they're very interesting creatures. The, the amount that they can understand and comprehend. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So, so then at some point you moved to Alberta and I, I know that you had quite a large reptile collection at home in Ontario and you had to, to sort of pick and choose what you took. Um, what, what did you have before you moved to Alberta? So before I moved to Alberta, I had majorly was crested geckos. They were a big thing for me. I used to uh, breed them. And then when people would come into reptilia and they were interested in getting a proper setup for a reptile, they would help them with all the equipment in the front of the zoo there. And then they would refer them out to me, example, for a crested gecko. And I would provide them with a crested gecko, knowing that they have now had the proper setup of enclosure and the information that they needed. So they would go home with that. I had a lot of crested geckos were mostly, but I had gargoyle geckos, chameleons, day geckos, tagus, green tree pythons. We actually bred chameleons also. So that was another one too. Ball pythons. Um, yeah, a little vast variety there of, of ones that I had been exposed to at the zoo that I started to realize were my favorite species. So then obviously you had to part ways with those as you moved. That must've been challenging. It definitely was. Um, when I was at reptilia for the most part of it too um i was with an ex of mine who we were doing it together so we had split and a lot of the reptiles actually just ended up staying with him um but the other ones that i had i have a couple of friends who worked for other reptile show companies and education companies that were able to take a lot of my reptiles and still continue what they're they were doing which was educating the public and children on reptiles so majority of them went to my friends in the field and i actually only kept three when I came. Did you drive from Mississauga to Fort McMurray? I didn't know. I actually flew. So I flew down with nothing first, nothing down here first. And then shortly after, once I was settled, I got my parents to send me my two dogs that I had at the time. I only had two and my three geckos were sent up to me in, in the February after the September that I had left. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. Cause that's actually a fairly big move. Uh, Fort McMurray for those who are listening is fairly far North in Alberta. So it's, it's, even though it's quite large, it's, I shouldn't say it's large, but there's, it's well established, but it's, it's sort of remote in a lot of ways. Yes. So once you moved there, you had to take sort of a little break besides your, the, the individual animals, the geckos that you had, you took a little bit of a break from, from the reptile industry, we can call it. And, uh, and then you were, you were telling me that you were working with the holistic nutrition or the holistic pet store. So I'd love to hear about that because I know pretty much nothing about dog and cat nutrition. And I know that you are a wealth of knowledge on that. So tell me about how you got into that initially. Yeah, definitely. So when I before I had moved out to Alberta, when I first started, um, when I reconnected with my boyfriend that I'm with now at the time, um, we were we connected over online for the longest time because he was out here. He's a firefighter. He was in school at the time and I was still back in Ontario. And then I decided to come up for a visit. I'd never been to Alberta yet, even though it had always been my dream to move here. So I came up for a visit. And during my visit, I enjoyed it so much that I decided I would try to see if I could find a job so I could move out here. So I went and handed out a bunch of resumes. I actually ended up getting seven responses um, within the time that I handed them out one of which was a pet store called Bone and Biscuit. Um, it's a specialty store. I should definitely specify that. It's for dogs and cats um, specifically. And they are interested in the most holistic and natural approaches to feeding um, dogs and cats as possible. So healthy foods, uh, bringing out the truths of the pet food world. Um, I had given my resume to two locations. They were actually both owned by the same owners and managed by the same manager. So they ended up liking my personality again and hiring me on there. And I have been there ever since um, I started. And I have learned a ridiculous amount of stuff about dog and cat nutrition, which has sparked so many more other career paths for me that I have touched upon in courses I have taken. So it's been an awesome journey there for sure. So when you when you approach or when you started working there in terms of the knowledge, because obviously you had two dogs at the time, was your knowledge basically uh, sort of 
the same as an average person in terms of dog nutrition? Or did you have a little more than that? And then what did you learn once you started working there? Oh, definitely. I had, I think my, my dog knowledge was pretty, pretty normal than the average, like the average person. And my cat knowledge was very, very low. Um, when I was moving up here, my dogs were not being fed the food, the best food, which I had been led like many people to believe was an actually really good food. Um, so when I had come up and I had started receiving all of my training, which came from not only the manager, um, but other courses that the company requires you to take in order to know this information. So I started to learn a lot. And again, when I'm in a field that I learn that I like, I learn very, very rapidly. I absorb the information and I learn rapidly. And I've been there now almost five years. And the amount of knowledge from when I started to now is completely different. I have completely altered the way my dog's lives are. I've completely altered the way they eat. Um, And then being in the dog field so heavily, I mean, cats as well, but I'm just more, I speak more of dogs because I'm more of the dog person. Um, being more in the dog world in general too, also led me to my dog training school. Um, and that's just also blown up now from continuing on with my dog knowledge. So tell me a little bit about what your dogs were eating and how they're eating now. And then maybe some of the, the popular misconceptions that people have with, I I'm imagining that the sort of standard kibble diet is not ideal. And what are some, some of the misconceptions with people thinking that that's okay? Well, see, a lot of the times, like people, it's it's been for generations. Like you go to the store, there's a bag of food, especially if it's at your grocery store, which is convenient because you're there buying groceries. Um, you get your dogs, your food. And people who argue this are not wrong that for many years, people have fed food that has been extremely, extremely low quality, and they have maybe not had issues. It's just a sad reality that dogs and, and cats are, are not being bred the way they used to be in just because uh, we never noticed anything before doesn't mean that there wasn't always something a little bit wrong there. Um, Your average kibble diet that you might find at very cheap department stores and grocery stores are definitely on your lower end. Personally, and this is just a personal opinion, I am no longer a kibble feeder whatsoever. Um, I like to stay away from the opinions in the dog food world and go more back to the science of what the animal is supposed to have, which is something that I've done what I do with my reptiles and everything too. Um, When I look at the anatomy of dogs and cats, I sort of figure out how they're carnivores, um, dogs being faculative carnivores, uh, cats being obligate carnivores. Uh, This is a meat base, what they need. And most of those kibble companies out on the market, if you actually have the chance to break down the ingredients on the back of the food, you're almost feeding them no meat and more synthetic vitamins and carbohydrates, which their bodies were never meant to actually process. Um, A big eye opener, if anybody's looking for information in forms of a, a documentary, Um, Pet Fooled on a, I think it's on Amazon Prime Video now, not Netflix, is a really good one. It exposes the truths of the pet food world. And when I first had my two dogs, they were definitely eating um, a lower end kibble diet, which I had thought was good because I'd get in a pet smart and they told me it was great and it was Chihuahua specific food. And I thought that that meant anything. And then when I came here, I slowly started to realize that I needed to start focusing on the anatomy and the biology of my dogs and to feed them better and to give them the best possible thing that they could tolerate. And that was best for their health. Like there is a difference between surviving and thriving. So that's where I make my food choices. Yeah. And animals are so good at hiding ailments and even people like we, we even hide ailments because you don't necessarily know. I mean, diet is one of the, I'm sure like the most controversial tub uh, subject out there. People have different opinions, but even people like you don't even necessarily know how you feel until you, there's a change in it. So you might have sore joints, but you've had sore joints for 20 years. So you don't realize until you've made a diet change or something. Can you, can you jump back to the, uh, the different types of carnivore? You mentioned the cats were one type and the dogs were another type. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah. So with the cats being an obligate carnivore, so this means that they have an obligate need for meat. There is really nothing else that is necessary in their diet for them to eat other than their meat. Um, And they should, they would normally be eating a whole carcass too. They would, uh, they would have the organs of the animal. They would eat bone. Everybody is so frightened to give their dogs and cats bone, but it just depends on the sense in which you give it to them. They need to have the ability to have the calcium, the, the vitamins and amino acids from the organs and the meat that comes from the muscle meat. So they're obligate in the sense that cats, they need to have just their meat. And most cat food on the market is stuffed with carbohydrates these days. Um, And then you have your dogs, which are like, you can classify them as faculative carnivores. So a lot of people will argue till they're blue in the face that dogs are omnivores just simply because they can take something from fruit and veg. But again, you look at the way that their jaws are structured, the way that their, their intestines are, the short intestinal tract meant for processing meat. 
um, not for car complex carbohydrates. They lack a certain enzyme in their saliva to break down carbs that omnivores and herbivores have that stuff. Um, so when you're trying to feed them something that they're not supposed to have, maybe they'll be okay, but you are kind of forcing that onto them. Um, you should really feed them more of what they should have. And so many people, like I'm a raw feeder, and I know a lot of people kind of like um, – Sometimes vegans, they get the bad rep for, oh my gosh, it's a vegan. They're going to shove it down my throat. It's the same thing with raw feeders. People, oh, raw feeders, they're going to shove it down my throat. It's not mo it's not about an opinion on feeding the dog. Not everyone's going to feed the raw food. But it's for me, in my opinion, and what I've studied on dogs and the schooling I've done and the courses I've taken, I can, I can understand that it's better for their body, feeding them what they need. They can, dogs, have fruits and vegetables for sure. They can take things from the antioxidants in them. Some greens are really good for certain vitamins and they can take a little bit from it. But when you try to substitute mostly plant matter in a carnivore animal, especially in a cat who's an obligate carnivore, you're going to run into some issues and some high vet bills. Yeah, I, I think a lot of kibble is, is it mostly corn or I, I know there's lots of wheat in them as well, but corn and wheat are kind of making up. It's sort of like what we're doing to cattle. We're feeding them corn and they're not really great at digesting corn and grain either. Yeah. We just keep feeding everybody this, including ourselves. Um, so, so what do you feed your dogs now? So obviously it's a raw diet. Can you just run through like a regular day of, of their diet? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. So for me, there's definitely multiple ways to feed raw food. Um, and the most important thing you can do is that people such as some veterinarians who haven't gotten external courses on it, um, or the average person who just thinks in terms of human is definitely going to try and think that raw food is nothing but dangerous because you're dealing with raw meat. So a raw food diet is definitely raw meat. There are multiple ways to do it. And it is extremely important that you are doing it properly. Because yes, if you don't balance your raw food properly, you can run into nutritional deficiencies or even vitamin overdoses and many other problems, overdosing or underdosing in calcium, so many different issues. Um, so I know a lot of people that actually make their own raw food. They actually source and gather the bones, the organs, the meats, and they make their own plates, which is totally fine if you've got the time and the knowledge for it. Even me with all my knowledge personally, I'm not comfortable and don't have the time to prepare and source my own ingredients. Living in Fort McMurray, things are very expensive here. Um, sometimes you can pay as much as $4.99 for a pound of apples. So things like that get expensive. I feed mine a um, already pre-balanced commercial raw foods and I switch between brands. Varying is extremely important. You never want to stick to one thing. You get different nutrients and different amino acids from different proteins. Um, mine are always changing. And I make sure that I'm only purchasing from companies in which have been inspected. So Bone and Biscuit has a huge, there's lots of stores like them, but they have a huge standard on making sure that they only source from companies that can answer the most in-depth questions. Where does your food come from? How is it sourced? What is it fed before it's slaughtered? How is it slaughtered? How soon after slaughter? Is it frozen? Is it flash frozen to kill any potential bacteria? Um, how are you balancing? What are your ratios? Do you have 80% uh, mass, uh, meat, 10% bone, 10% organ? What's your veg content? What does your facility look like? All those questions. If those questions can't be answered and are not comfortable to the owners of the company's standards, it is not an approved product. It won't be sold in their stores, which is why a bone and biscuit is an incredible place to go. Because although sometimes you might see a higher price tag on the food, it's because it comes from very high end sourcing, um, which I think is super, super important. So mine are fed a commercially already balanced raw food diet. And if I do supplement with something that's unbalanced, I always make sure that I only throw that in every now and again, so that they are getting all of their nutrients, le nutrient levels and vitamins the best that they can through their raw food. And I have noticed significant changes um, in them. Good for the good. Yeah, that, that was gonna be my question, because obviously, especially the first two that you had were on the sort of the standard kibble diet. And then you, you switched them to the raw meat. For one, was it easy to switch them? Did, were they were they just happy to eat the, the fresh food that you were giving them? And then was there a difference? Like, what did you notice in terms of was there energy or behavior differences? Oh, yeah, definitely. So another a big thing about um, dog, well, little dogs, um, especially is that they're known for dental disease. Um, and dogs, a lot of dogs, especially even older dogs, even big ones can get the dental disease, but mostly those small dogs. And a lot of that is happening because it's kind of be like us having a whole bunch of stuff stuck stuck to our teeth and never brushing them. A dog can't digest or break down um, certain carbohydrates in their mouth, carb carbs in their mouth at all. So it sticks to their teeth. It's the idea of feeding them a whole bunch of carbohydrates gives them really bad dental disease. And then of course, dental disease can lead to heart problems and bad infections, which can alter and actually kill them in their lifestyle. So when I switched uh, mine over, it was fairly easy. 
Um, when I started, I only had two chihuahuas and they are definitely known for being picky. So they were free feeders. I would just put food down like most people think is okay and let them pick throughout the day. But with a raw food diet, because yes, you are dealing with raw meat. Yes, there is more bacteria, but your dog is designed to be able to handle that bacteria. So I just had to start not leaving the food to sit out to gain actual bad bacteria. So I had to start getting them on a, on a, a switch. The biggest switch for me was not free feeding them anymore and putting food down. And the second they would leave the bowl, it would have to get taken away and tossed. So they started to learn to eat on a routine. And that's the hardest thing for a lot of people, especially I think in Fort McMurray, because there's so many oil field workers here that work long days. They're gone in the very early morning and they don't get back till very late at night and they don't have the time for it, um, which is understandable. But it's an important part is to make sure that it's on a schedule and not left out all the time to gain bacteria. The differences I've seen in them since changing them to raw um, coat and teeth have been a big one. Their teeth are in better shape. They're not getting dental disease. Their coats are a lot softer. They're shedding a lot less. Um, I have six dogs now, so having a lot less hair is very important to me. <laughs> And they shed less. And the biggest thing, honestly, their poop, the poop that, that they have is so tiny and so small that and it's crumbly because when you have a huge, like when they poop out a, a large amount of poop, which is common in kibble fed dogs, that's actually because it's a lot of waste. So yeah. you're feeding, maybe you have to feed three cups of food to give your dog what they need on what it says on the back of the bag, but their poop is so large and most of it's coming out as waste. It's not getting absorbed. When you're feeding a raw food diet, their body was meant to eat that. So because they can digest it properly and take almost everything from that, the poops are very minimal and they wash away even with a little bit of a hose. They just crumble away. So it gets you to show that what you're feeding your dog, most of it is staying in their body and showing them positive effects on joints, coat, teeth, poop, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point that, that those fillers in those kibble foods it just shoots right through them. Like they cannot digest it. So it just travels along the digestive tract and comes out the other end. Yes. <laughs> Has all of this knowledge that you've gained changed the way you see the, the the way you care for your reptiles in terms of the nutrition? Oh, definitely. Yeah, because uh, it's the same thing out there. You can go to the pet store or the reptile store and you can see all these like commercially made um, diets out there like bearded dragon diets, this and oh, you don't want to feed your your animal live uh, live bugs. Well, here's some preserved bugs, which are not actually as natural as you think. Um, here's a diet that you can feed your bearded dragon instead of having to feed him bugs and veggies. And it's just if you just go back to what they're really just supposed to have, I understand that convenience is important to human beings. But it's also important that our our animals are healthy, what you're feeding your animal can be um, a nice preventative care for their life, or it can be the like, slowest form of poison, it depends what you're feeding them. So I've been able to pretty much look at an animal based on its individual level. Now, if it has any existing health problems that might alter it from eating a certain thing. And if it doesn't, then what is it as a species? And what does it thrive on? What does its insides need? And that's now how I feed my animals, and how I'll choose to feed all of my animals going forward, no matter what they are. Yeah. And like you said, a variety is huge, even in reptiles, feeding them the same thing every day with the same dust and, and, and whatnot eventually is, is not going to be ideal for them. Yeah. So in, in Fort McMurray, obviously it is quite remote. So you have, you have a bunch of animals now. Are you able to source different insect feeders and whatnot, or do you kind of have to do your own little breeding operation for food? So it's been, uh, it's been a definitely different than when I was living in Toronto because there were so many resources to get to and stores that were so close for variety. Um, being so remote here, it actually is quite difficult. Um, the bugs that we get in here, they're always flown in on a plane. So we have our crickets come in. We have tried to breed our own crickets and I've done successfully in the past, but for whatever reason, I can't seem to successfully do it here. So we have a friend of ours who owns a, an aquarium shop down downtown for McMurray called FNA Aquariums. Um, Michael is the owner of that. He's really, really great. And he brings in our bug orders for us that come in, they get flown in on a plane. And so when there's issues in terms of weather or like extreme weather or just extreme temperatures, it definitely can delay the bugs and it definitely brings the price point up. I have never in my life had to pay as much for bugs as I do here. And then the animals that don't eat the bugs, even the stuff at the grocery store, groceries here are extremely expensive. Everything here is extremely expensive. So when you have a collection of reptiles like I have now, it's it does definitely cost quite a bit and it's harder to source. I can't get as many in 
one of my bearded dragons loves his hornworms, but hornworms, almost every time they're flown in here to the city, they're arriving dead. They're not making the travel, even though they try to temperature control it. So certain sensitive bugs, we're not really able to successfully get every once in a blue moon, we'll get them. But it's, it's frustrating for sure. But I do my very best, even if I have to drive down to Edmonton and do a stock up on a bunch of bugs at an expo, um, and then bring them back myself, I try to give my, my animals the most variety that they need to be healthy. Yeah, and you can do a lot with gut loading as well to sort of vary what they're ingesting. And I mean, it's probably worth noting, being in Canada already somewhat feels remote in the hobby. It's actually more difficult to get just basic supplies here than it is in the States. Everything is in the States. When when you go to the States, there's like, you can't believe what they have in the stores. I'm not saying Canada is like desolate or anything. It's just, it, there is a difference. And then to take it one step further to go to up to Fort McMurray, it is a, a it, it, it is quite remote and the expense is crazy. And like you were saying before we even started recording, it's been like between minus 50 and minus or minus 40, minus 50 all week. It's uh, it has its challenges. Definitely has its challenges. Only one in the, in the summertime, there is only one road in and one road out of Fort McMurray. If you're in the winter and it's cold enough, you have the winter roads to go out to the reservations, but that's still not going to get you very far. So there's only one road in and one road out and we are in the corner. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I, one of the other areas that I see with nutrition that uh, is something that I'm exploring more now is is just obesity. And I'm sure this happens a lot in, in dogs and cats. I mean, I know it does. And in reptiles as well. The thing with reptiles is we don't necessarily see it as, as easily. But I'm guessing with dogs and cats, their obesity must be rampant, especially on those sort of high carbohydrate or carbohydrate diets. Yeah, definitely. I've... St- I'm giggling to myself over here because all of the girls I work with at the store, the Bone Biscuit, they know that if there's one thing that makes my hair stand up and makes my blood pressure rise is overweight animals. Um, yeah, with the reptiles, like you were saying, it's definitely harder for a lot of people to, to try and tell, even if they are trying their best. But for dogs and cats, <clears throat> for some reason, I just, I can't process why it's a difficult thing to see when they are, because it's quite obvious, even in those breeds that are thicker, like your bulldogs, it is still very easy to see when your dog is overweight or your cat is overweight. And it's for the most part, unless it's a medical condition, it's preventable. That is the most frustrating thing is people have such lame relationships and, and low end relationships with their animals that they feel the only way to get them to do anything or to bond is just by food. But when you're having an animal that has the ability to connect with a human being, such as a dog and a a cat, mostly I say more for dogs, dogs are a little bit more affectionate. Sometimes you you're lacking the relationship with your animal and just becoming a walking Pez dispenser, but your dog is no longer seeing you as, as a person to bond with as much. Like they're seeing you just as an endless food supply and you think you're just providing them with love, but it's a sad truth that you you're slowly killing them with love. Like you do need to regulate it. And if, a lot of people look at their pets like their kids. And in some cases, it's really annoying. And in some cases, it's accurate. So if you want to look at it in that case, you really shouldn't just give your child endless, endless, endless amounts of food, because you're going to have an unhealthy child with a lot of medical conditions. And it's the same thing with animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And yeah, you're right. It's very easy to see when they have that sort of barrel shaped body. And, and, uh, and yeah, they will die of some sort of weight related issue and uh, without a doubt so uh, later after after i know that after you know you got into the, the holistic um pet store you ended up going to some animal behavior call or the animal behavior college and i would love to hear about that and and i guess was that because you were sort of sparked to learn more about dogs and then it opened up a whole new world for you yeah so when i i was working at the uh, at the bona biscuit for a while as well and then being in fort mcmurray where things are definitely a little rough if you're not working in the oil fields um, I decided I needed to have a secondary job so that I could uh, afford the the lifestyle I wanted for my dogs, the, the things I wanted to give them. So I actually got a job at the SPCA, the local SPCA in our um, community. Um, and I was there for a little bit. Um, I think I was there for a year and a half, two years total. Uh, I started off as a basic kennel attendant, but then I met an individual there who was a friend of mine. Her name is Shelby. Um, she was an animal care coordinator. So she was in charge of the enrichment, um, the behavior modifications, um, training purposes and everything like that. And I really started to take an interest in what she was doing. Um, and I learned really well from her and I would always try to shadow her. And she started to show me the interesting side of dog training. So then I started to kind of have an interest in dog training. Um, and then 
shortly after that Shelby had, she had left, she went to pursue school back in Nova Scotia. Um, so I applied for her position as I had a really good understanding. I was able to understand and interpret dogs really well. And um, being an internal employee, I had the chance to step into the position and they, they offered it to me. Um, because of that, I had the chance to work with local trainers in town and which led me to want to actually get my certification in dog training uh, because I was working with it so much at the shelter. I loved to figure out why the dog was this way and why a person might label this dog as aggressive and needs to be euthanized, but really it's just a, a modification that needs help. It's an animal that's just been misled. So I went and applied to Animal Behavioral College, which is based out of California, uh, but it's an online course and it requires you to do half of the course is book work and exams, um, learning a lot of theory, a lot about people who invented the first steps of dog training, all of that stuff, behavior, body language. And then the second part of after your uh, written testing was that you had to do a practicum. So I did um, with a local trainer in town who was certified by the school, I was able to start to learn the logistics of dog training. Um, that particular trainer um, had a pretty um, narrow path and only certain ways he wanted to train. Um, it was just his way. But I then started to slowly realize by my own research and being in school, that there are so many different ways to train animals. Um, and the school was just my first step. So I learned so much in that school. Um, and it's a, it focuses mostly on positive uh, reinforcement training, which I do think is important, but I did lead myself with my own research and experiences within myself and um, in the SPCA and then working as a dog trainer on my own, that it is more important to be balanced. Um, different animals and different individuals need different methods of training. Um, you can keep it the most positive possible with getting the best and fastest results. So that's what the school sparked in me. And I ended up graduating that school within a year with high honors. Um, and I did really well. And I'm going to continue to pursue that. I still do dog training to this day. So what sort of dogs are you working with? Obviously, if you're dealing with animals that are in essentially a, a humane society, are they just sort of the standard behavioral issues like aggression and, and whatnot? And then you're able to correct their behaviors before they get adopted type thing? Yeah, that was kind of the goal. Um, every now and again, there'd be one that come in. It was just a little bit difficult and the severity could vary. Um, of course, um, there are different levels of trainers too and what they are specializing in. I am not a trainer that specializes in aggression by any means, but I definitely understand it. Uh, there are definitely some good resources in our city for people that are really into the highly aggressive cases. And that would be my cue to refer out. A good trainer always knows when it's not quite their cup of tea and they need to refer out to somebody who might have a little bit more experience in the field. But for the most part, the things that were coming into the SPCA was a lot of the times that people who got puppies from the SPCA and never, they only let the puppy be a puppy and never really gave it any rules. So it just has your basic misbehavior, sometimes aggression, certain levels of aggression that were just misunderstood, I was able to fix and make sure that the dog could go out in public and be adopted. Um, other ones would be referred out to trainers. And in your very, very worst case scenarios, some of the dogs, of course, were euthanized. Um, because even when you have access to the trainers, it's sometimes it's a medical condition, um, or you don't have the resources at the time to help the animal, which is the most unfortunate part of the job. But for every animal that I could possibly help, um, I would. And if I had to personally drive the animal and take it to another place so that it could get what it needed, I would. I have in the past adopted an animal, actually, like brought it home with the sole purpose of knowing that it wasn't going to survive in the shelter, but I could find it better. And I did end up finding him better. And I drove him far away, eight, eight and a half hour drive. And I was still bringing dogs there. So being able wow. to help them myself or to refer them out is is amazing because then you get to watch them get adopted when they were just living in a cage. So, so that's really neat that the, in terms of the actual college, I've not heard of the Animal Behavior College. So this, if anybody that's interested in learning more about animal behavior and or, or training, this would be a good opportunity for them, I'm sure. Yeah, they have, they actually have a, they have dog training courses. They have cat training courses. They have grooming. It's a, it's a pretty good school. It's really in depth. They're, they're easy to, to speak with and to access. You can usually contact someone always. They send you your materials very quickly and the information is very in depth. If you have ever have any questions about your info that you're reading, they're always there to answer it. So I did personally really enjoy the school. Hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. And that, that's a great opportunity for someone who doesn't, maybe doesn't want to go to university, but wants to learn more. There's other things out there other than your standard kind of biology degree type thing. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So let's discuss your current reptile project happening in Fort McMurray. So obviously you came there with the three and since then it's uh, slowly expanded and now you have a, a little business happening. 
Yeah, definitely. So I flew up with my two Crested Geckos. So I flew up with my Crested Gecko Kalua and my Crested Gecko Chaos. And then my Lichianus Gecko Pudge, who I helped was very young and, and sickly. So I helped kind of bring her back. So they were my like prized ones and I brought them with me. Um, I realized that there was nothing like what I was doing in Fort McMurray. So when I moved up here in September of 2015, um, shortly after they got flown up to me, and I didn't think about it too, too much as I was just more focused on just working. And then I slowly started to miss it. Um, I was still able to follow Reptilia on Facebook and uh, the group chat that we were all in. And I really missed being able to teach them. And there's no zoos in Fort McMurray. There's pet stores where you might be able to go look at the odd bearded dragon or leopard gecko that's up for adoption. But there was no resources in which to get real outside of a pet store education on these creatures. And then living so far north in Canada, we are not exposed to a lot of reptiles here. Like there are reptiles in Canada, which are still limited, but in Fort McMurray, people are not exposed to that. So the only interactions they have with it is if they've went to the Calgary or Edmonton Zoo, which are the nearest zoos, or if they've seen them on TV. And a lot of the times TV can villainize them. So I slowly started to reach out to places and people around town and I wanted to try and rescue or, or get rehomes for as many of the reptiles as possible. I didn't want to have to purchase them for the educational purposes. And it took about two years and then we were finally able to gather enough reptiles from around the country to start doing our educational reptile shows. Um, our furthest reptile actually came from Ottawa. She That was our first tagu that we got. Um, wow. And I started... Yeah, I started up all that and I, I tried to pick them from rescues such as the Edmonton rescues, Calgary rescues, um, and Ottawa rescues as well that are some in Ontario. And so do yeah. you just keep an eye on different rescues across the country and then when you saw an animal that you thought would be a good fit, you applied for it and then they, did you, you had have to, I'm sure, pay for shipping to get an animal like a tag you all the way from Ottawa to Fort Yeah, McMurray? definitely. Um, I would put out posts on, on Facebook groups saying that I was searching for this for these purposes and for educational lists and that. Um, and I would use, uh, for the ones we did have to fly in and we didn't actually drive to get, we used, uh, reptiles, uh, express to ship our reptiles to us. Cause they've always been really good. They are the ones that shipped my reptiles to me from Ontario. So I trusted them. And then I ended up setting it up with the rescue in Ottawa, which is reptiles rock rescue. Um, he ended up sending me the tag She was brought to them in very, very poor condition. And they brought her up to healthy condition to fly. And she came to us and we continued her care. And now she's, um, a great part of our educational programs. She's the whole famous toothless. She does have teeth. She's just named after the dragon. <laughs> right. So what, what do you guys have now? You have obviously quite a large collection. You don't have to list through it all, but maybe some of the, the main players. Yeah, for sure. So our, for our business reptile rodeo, we um, have pretty much species that we know are going to be better to travel with. So more hardy. So they're not going to be super stressed, such as the chameleon. Um, and ones that are known for being quite docile with, to be around children. So our main characters that we have we have about let's say 30 or so reptiles but the species generally rotate through the same ones we just make sure that they have the ability to be rotated so they're not overworked so we have our black and white argentine tagus we have a male and a female one of those um because they're great for learning and they're a nice big lizard without needing to have an, an enclosure for a water monitor right um, we have crested geckos because they're great little creatures to ease little ones into it my lichianus geckos we have tarantulas um, docile species of tarantulas that are able to come out and educate uh, ball pythons are really good we've got one nippy ball python that we actually use to to show and teach about how snakes eat so we've got him um what else we got their boas our boas are very popular everyone likes to see the big snake at uh, at our educational shows and feel them and see how they are so we kind of just rotate through the species that are known for being good for travel and and teaching so is it pretty much you kind of go to schools and classrooms and birthday parties and just bring some animals and then get to uh, just educate the kids on, on the different species? Yeah, definitely. Um, most Our most popular is definitely birthday parties. Um, it's uh, It's been a big market for that. It's something to do. There's, there's I mean, to an extent, uh, there's not a ton to do in Fort McMurray unless you're really outdoorsy, uh, which I am, which is good. But a lot of times it's hard to find resources and stuff for the kids in order to have a nice, fun birthday party with something different. So what I do is we bring them over to the houses or to the venue, wherever we might be needing to go. And then we educate mostly. We don't like to be mistaken with a petting zoo. That is our biggest thing. We, we do travel to birthday parties and we are fun and we do schools and corporate events too, but we base everything off of education. It's super important. We find um, we don't just show up to a place and put our animals under ridiculous amounts of stress and let every single person hold them and touch them and everything. We always alter 
our services based on the crowd we're presented with, whether that be size, age, behavior, um, the amount of people, everything. Um, and our interactions will vary too. If we have a very large crowd, um, we will have very limited interactions. It'll be nothing more than a little finger and the animal will stay out for a short period of time because we want to teach that. We are teaching about these animals, not exploiting them. And we want to teach you in order to teach you and keep them healthy and happy. We have to not stress them out. Right. Yeah, that's that, that's kind of what I, I really like that message that you give. It's sort of education versus exploitation. And we see so much exploitation, in, especially in this business, because the animals are so poorly understood and they do have... They, they sort of carry a large wow factor for the average person be, n- knowing nothing about them that it's it would be so easy to go down that road to just bring out the snake and put it around everybody's neck and, and do that sort of wow show. But it's so important that we don't do that just to keep the industry healthy. Of course, that's that's a big thing that it really gets to me is that's a lot of the times I, I'm very transparent with that, like our documents that people have to sign for our, our presentations and the reminders they get and the, the introductions they get, everything always starts off with telling people that noise levels need to be kept at good levels for because they can hear it. Um, The interactions need to be gentle. Um, I understand that you want your one year old to hold the snake, but they don't understand how not to squeeze yet. So I'm going to have to assist them with their back of their hand instead of their palm. So I do ease them into it because I do think it's important for children to learn at an early age while they're developing about reptiles. But I don't think that in order to do that, we should not teach them that every animal has its boundaries. Um, And especially with our reptiles, too, where it might be a little bit harder to read their body language than maybe a dog growling that's easier. So that's our our main message is definitely the education over exploitation. Is there anything you wish you knew prior to starting uh, the reptile education business? Um, Yeah, you know, I wish that that's actually goes back to what I was probably just saying, I wish that I had known that when you have a business like this, people do just see it as a petting zoo, um, for the most part anyways. Um, and they see it as just an entertainment purpose. And a lot of people aren't really all that focused on the care of, of them. Um, they're more just interested in the picture they can get or the, how excited their kid is or how excited their kid can be. And don't get me wrong. I want your kid to be excited because an excited person exposed to something is going to be excited to learn about it but the excitement levels um, need to go past getting that cool picture if that's not what the animal's comfortable with I've had people get angry with me because I won't put the tarantula on their newborn baby's face for a photo Uh, and it's like these things are are important and I just I wish I had known because when I first started the business I wish I had been more aware that I needed to be super transparent with the fact that it was mostly education based And then I started to learn the hard way that people weren't seeing it that way. So I did switch it up very quickly. But if I'd have known that going before, I would have uh, definitely uh, made it a little bit more obvious in the beginning and saved myself a little bit of frustration. And now we're pretty transparent and pretty aggressive with the fact that we want it to be education based. Um, And it's been going pretty well because of that. We, We make sure that we have our rules and regulations very strict. Yeah, that's so true. And as you're speaking, I could totally see how that would happen because as a reptile enthusiast yourself, you're so excited about the animals and it's almost hard to put yourself in the shoes of somebody that's, you know, booking a party. So you'd, you'd think like they want to learn, but really half of them probably just want to see a crazy snake or, a, you know, an anaconda or something that they always think is an anaconda. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's definitely a challenge. But I'm sure there's some hugely rewarding pieces of it as well when, when you do get to do the education piece. Oh, definitely. I I love um, it's especially going to the parties and whether it's a kid or an adult, that person that's terrified and is hiding and won't touch and tells me they won't do it. And they're just they've been scared, especially the older like the adults who have been scared of snakes my whole life, been scared of spiders my whole life. Then they start to learn about these creatures and they and they see us handle them and they see the kids handle them. And then we describe why these animals are acting this way and why they'd be different in the wild. You then you start to realize that the fear is really a learned behavior. It wasn't, it wasn't something that most of the time happened to them. Even a lot of people, it's not like, Oh, I got bit by a snake when I was a kid. Now I'm scared. I almost never hear that. It's always, I'm just terrified of snakes. And I'm like, well, have you ever touched one? Well, no, I haven't. So they've just never been exposed to it. And humans definitely, a lot of us fear the unknown. So that rewarding feeling comes from when that person tells me there's no way they're touching it. And sometimes they go as far as having the snake in their arms and the joy on their face and how excited they are that they did it. And at least if they never do it again, they said they did it and they've understood that animal a little bit more. 
Do you think that fear of snakes is something that's inherent in being a human or, or are these people influenced from the media? You know, we, like you said, a lot of times they're not framed in the best way on TV and, and t- or on movies and whatnot, but, or, or is it something that's more genetic within us? Uh, definitely. I think that it comes from multiple places on why the fear might rise. It definitely can come from media for sure. Um, sometimes people are ex- are living in places in the world where these animals might be of an actual danger to them and they've just had bad things happen to them, their family, their pets, etc. cetera. Um, some of it comes from religion too. Some religions especially look on snakes as, as being um, a deceitful creature, a, a bad creature. And then there's your news articles again with media that that put out these these posts that scare people when the, actually the facts are not quite correct. So I, I do believe that they are maybe it's the I think humans they might be a little bit iffy about things that have too many legs and not enough legs and move weird because <laughs> when we see like a scary movie if we have a, a like something that's been possessed and it's moving in a creepy way like that's scary to us even though it might be a human on the screen. So when we see a snake that has no legs we might think it's kind of creepy that and it looks slimy and it's moving and then a tarantula oh, that has too many legs like that's creepy to me. So I think the too many legs and not enough legs and the way things move can definitely set humans off because that also sets animals off. But it's also a huge part of it, especially this day with all the social media and TV and everything we have. I think they're just not portrayed very nicely. There's not enough education about them. Um, not enough people are letting their kids watch nature shows and too many of them are letting them watch um fictional like cartoons and and things that are not as educational from animals so i think a lot of it's learned and a lot of it's um religious but a lot of it also comes from some human nature too if we're not yeah and it's so easy for the media to play into those natural fears that it's it doesn't take much to make someone freaked out with that with a lot of legs and all the animals that you guys have are in your your home right you guys care for them as a just an everyday thing we did for well for the most part. We had we have a couple of our geckos here and stuff, and we had a lot of all the reptiles here at one point. Um, but it was just mostly until we got too big that we can't we couldn't have the space for them anymore. So we do have them at our friend's house, who's pretty much just right around the corner. Um, and she has her whole basement that was not being used, and we have the ability now to make all our custom enclosures to make them bigger than they need to be, um, so that the reptiles can have the best enclosure possible when they are inside of it. So oh, we definitely awesome. keep them there. We, we only have a few of them here with us too, but being a full-time job still with all the dogs that we have and the reptiles we have to go to and from every day to take care of, it's, it's definitely a lot of work. It would be easier if they were just in my house, but we don't have the space. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Once you get to 30 plus, uh, real estate <laughs> becomes very expensive in the home. <laughs> it does, yeah. So the last thing I really wanted to touch on, I, I know you'd also let me know that you were doing uh, forestry and wildlife conservation. And I was curious about what that was. Was it a course or... Yeah, so it's a course So this course I was taking uh, based on my busy, busy lifestyle and my inability to sit still in a classroom. Regular schooling doesn't generally work all that great for me. I like something that I can go at my own pace, um, something that has the ability for me to learn at at different um, platforms and to even do like internships and practicums, for example. So I've taken I just finished the course um, Wildlife and Forestry uh, Conservation from ICS Canada, so International Career School. And this was the Canadian division. And it was, uh, this one was all a book work. And then I'm very soon going to be updating my resume and trying to pursue, pursue some sort of position within the fish and wildlife. Um, Cause I'd really like to work with wildlife. Um, at least for now, one of my goals would be to work again at a zoo because I loved working at a zoo or at a wildlife rehabilitation center. It's definitely my dream goal. So I did a lot of studying on North America, North America's animals, um, all of those things which is the first time I really touched upon um, things that weren't dogs, cats, or reptiles. So because of that, um, that schooling, um, I haven't received my diploma yet, but I did watch my average pass with a 98 average because I understand it so well. And I'm hoping to get a job in that career very soon because our end goal will be to move out to the Canadian Rockies, actually, which has always been my dream. And I'd like to work with larger mammals there. How long was the course? Uh, the course itself, they allow you two years to finish it, but you can work at your own pace. Um, I finished rather quickly, so I did finish in just over a year. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, that's. I think that's something that I would like to look into as well because it sounds really interesting. And, and same with me, I would love to get into the wildlife uh, conservation side like here in Canada a little bit more. So that's a, definitely a unique option. 
Yeah, Reptilia always, when I worked there, they always were about conservation as well. So they they focused a lot on conservation. And um, I, I enjoyed that part of the conservation as well, too. But living where I'm living, um, it might it would make more sense for me to have a little bit more education on the North American animals side of it, as opposed to just animals that I'm not going to find around here. Perhaps one day I will go somewhere out to uh, like Australia or something's a goal of mine to learn about their creatures. But for now, this course was on North American animals. And I hope that it will that plus my enthusiasm plus whatever experience I get will be enough to secure me a dream position working outdoors in the mountains, tracking wildlife or is something in the wildlife field would make me truly fulfilled. Yeah. Well, North American species are just, uh, I'm sure you found were fascinating as well. So that can be highly rewarding, I'm sure. Oh, definitely. And if you continue on the path that you've been sort of traveling at a mile a minute, I'm sure you will hit that goal in the very near future. So yeah. thank you very much, Emily, for, for joining me today. I appreciate everything you've told me. This A lot of that I didn't know. I didn't know much about the dog nutrition as well. So that was great. Can you let everybody know where they can find you and Reptile Rodeo and, and, and everything on Instagram or, or the internet? Yeah, for sure. Um, if for Reptile Rodeo, for our educational reptile shows um, local to Fort McMurray, even if you're just looking to follow along for information, it's uh, on Facebook or Instagram at Reptile Rodeo YMM. That's Reptile Rodeo YMM as in Mary. So YMM is the code for Fort McMurray. And then uh, for my dogs and dog training and everything dog related, uh, as my puppy drags a bag across the floor. <laughs> <laughs> You can find uh, my uh, dog's Instagram and our training uh, Instagram at Paw Print Explorers 22 on Instagram. That's where all my dog stuff is. Oh, awesome. I didn't know about that one. So I'm definitely going to go yeah, follow that right now. <laughs> great. Well, thank we you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. It was a great chat. All right, that brings us to the end of another episode. Thank you so much for listening. Emily, thank you very much for spending the time with me. That was a fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed all of the knowledge you were able to share with us. And of course, everything that we discussed in today's episode can be found in the show notes or the description on YouTube. Just a reminder to keep an eye on my YouTube channel because I have been challenged by TC Houston of the Reptile Mountain and that will be uh, out next week. There'll be some more explanation on that at some point later in January. Thank you very much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you do want to go check them out, there's always links in the show notes and the description. If you do end up purchasing something, a commission does come back to me, which helps support the show. Thank you very much for listening to this episode, and I will talk to you guys next time.